want to welcome everybody to our sixth Baskerville Institute webinar. Uh, if you recall, we started with Professor Shahavi in September. And today we have Professor Michael Zirinsky, who Matt will introduce later for the subject. Uh, I'm also pleased to inform you that our final speaker of the year will be Reza Aslan. And Reza Aslan is currently working on a major book on Baskerville to be published by WW Norton and Press. And he's also working with a film production on Baskerville. So I could not have thought of a better person to conclude our lecture series than Reza Aslan, a New York Times bestseller, and also a great friend of US-Iran friendship studies. So first, a happy Norus to everyone. Happy Norus 1400, the year 1400 in Iran. Uh, Iranians are celebrating a new century. And at the dawn of another century, 1300 was the beginning of the constitutional revolution in Iran. So we are now coming back after 100 years with a new century of Norus. And we want to wish all of our Iranian friends who are joining us from Iran and also from Europe and other parts of the world, a very happy Nowruz and wishing everyone a prosperous Nowruz. Nowruzutan Mubarak Bashe, but Nowruzutan Piruz Bashe. So we want to welcome Professor Michael Zurinsky. I'm so pleased that he could join us. So Matt, our publication director, will introduce Michael and the subject for our talk today, American Presbyterian Missionaries in Iran. Well, thank you, Bahman, and, and to everyone with the Baskerville Institute and the board, its supporters, and of course, uh, most important, everybody who tunes in to each of the webinars and makes them such enriching, stimulating events with, with great questions and comments and discussion. Um, it gives me great honor um, to introduce Dr. Michael Zorinsky today. I'll just start with a quick um, anecdote. I was doing some research, reading old community school yearbooks uh, recently, and I came across a reference to uh, one Mike Zorinsky of East Meadow, Long Island, who was referenced, uh, described as a history whiz and political genius. <laughs> So how about that? Well, here we are today, uh, many years later, about to hear Michael Zorinsky share a career's worth of wisdom on the history and politics of American missionaries in Iran. Um, just a brief note about Dr. Zorinsky. After graduating from the Presbyterian-run community school in Tehran, he earned a PhD in history uh, from the University of North Carolina. He spent decades at Boise State University where he taught modern European and Middle Eastern histories he is currently Professor Emeritus in the History Department at Boise State University, and we are very grateful that he is willing to spend some time with us today. Many of us who are in attendance, of course, will be familiar with um, Dr. Zorinsky's long list of publications. Uh, rather than list every article, I'll just highlight an aspect of his scholarship that as I reread some of his work this morning, I was reminded is it's quite distinctive. Uh, so his research, and this is the way he describes it in one of his articles, marks the interaction of several, and this is a quote, marks the interaction of several separate histories, which normally are considered only in isolation from one another. These topics include American social history, Christian church history, the history of 20th century international politics, as well as modern Iranian history, end quote. And so for that reason, Dr. Zorinsky has published in the International Journal of Middle East Studies and Iranian Studies, uh, the journal American Presbyterians, to name just a few, along with many book chapters and various edited collections that are on our shelves. Uh, this work is noteworthy for its insights into the histories of Iranian education, women and gender in the mission field, religious and ethno-linguistic minorities in Iran, the era of both world wars and so many other subjects. In these ways and others, he so brilliantly places the history of late Qajar and early Pahlavi Iran in the broader context of the modern world. And that is why he is here with us today. So with that, I give you Dr. Michael Zorinsky. 
thank you, Matt. That was amazing that you went back and found that yearbook quote. Well, happy no roots to everyone. It is a new day, and I hope that we can take a few steps towards a new day in the U.S.-Iranian relations as well. Um, what I'd like to do today, and I, I apologize for reading because I get carried away if I don't, is to discuss some of the ambiguities in the early American involvement with Iran, which ultimately led to misunderstandings and conflict. I share the objective of the Baskerville Institute to, quote, facilitate friendship and peace between the Iranian and American peoples. But I believe that to do so, it is necessary to understand the ambiguities which hid beneath the amity of the early relationship. In this context, I um, want to try to advance my next slide. And I find myself, there we go. Well, in this context, I want to do two things. First of all, uh, I think the fact that Iran and America have ambiguous relations in the 19th and early 20th century in part is because of the enormous distance between the two countries and the enormous time it took to get from the United States to Iran. In the 19th century, this could take many, many months. Early in the 20th century, it still took three months for the American minister to get from Washington to Tehran in 1922. And one of the missionaries who I talk about in my paper uh, took a similar time to get there uh, from uh, her home in California to her post in Mashhad in 1929. But I also want to say that I'm shaped by my own history as a child of a cold warrior. In 1956, my father, an attorney with the New York office of the Corps of Engineers, was appointed counsel to Gulf District, the new Corps office in Tehran. The Corps was tasked to supervise construction of new facilities for the Iranian military. I was 13 years old when we arrived in Tehran and I was enrolled in community school, the only Presbyterian school to survive Iran's 1940 nationalization of foreign schools. Begun in the 1930s as a school for missionary children, by 1956, it was well established as an international school for English speaking children, preparing boys and girls for university. Housed in the 1890 built quarters of the former Mission Hospital, uh, the main entry to the school greeted all with a plaque quoting a Bible verse from John 22, ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. This same Bible verse greets visitors to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, carved into stone at the assistance of then director of central intelligence, Alan Dulles, who himself was the son of a Presbyterian minister and whose first job out of college at Princeton was as a teacher in a mission school in India. For most of its history, the altruistic work of the Presbyterian mission was based on arrogant suppositions. These included the ideas that Christianity was superior to any other religion, that Calvinist Protestantism was the best form of Christianity, that America was a Christian, indeed a Protestant nation, and that America was or could be a shining city on a hill called to try to save the world. Thus motivated, Presbyterian missionaries came to Iran to preach the gospel of American Calvinist Christianity from the 1830s, learning Persian and other Iranian languages, raising their families in their new home, and spending their entire working lives serving Iranians as ministers, as educators, as medical professionals, and as relief workers. 
Although the arrogance was real, it was clothed in ambiguity. The missionaries concentrated on secular work, education, medicine, and relief, rather than on proselytization, even as they sold this work at home as bait for the gospel hook. They cultivated good relations with Iranian authorities who forbade converting Muslims. Indeed, this official hostility towards conversion reflected a deep-seated Iranian reluctance to change religion, whether from Islam, from Armenian or Assyrian Christianity, from Judaism, Zoroastrianism, or the newer Baha'i faith. As missionary physician Rola Hoffman recorded in his memoir, two of his Iranian colleagues, quote, declared themselves Christians at heart, shared Mahatma Gandhi's position that changing one's religion is like changing one's parenthood. This quotation, indeed, reinforces one of the extracurricular conclusions I drew from my own experience as a non-Christian student in a Presbyterian school. Also obscuring American arrogance was the fact that prior to World War II, the U.S. government refused to be drawn into Iranian affairs. The State Department opposed Howard Baskerville's role in the defense of Tabriz in 1909. It distanced itself from Morgan Schuster's 1911 financial mission. It condemned William Shedd's use of relief money to support allied military efforts in 1918. And it failed to intervene when Britain refused to seat the Iranian delegation to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. The Presbyterian missionaries all the while earned Iranian goodwill towards America by their work in education and medicine inadvertently thereby suggesting that America was not imperialist. U.S. actions at that time in Mexico, Cuba, Hawaii, and the Philippines, of course, tell a very different story. Of all the Presbyterian mission works in Iran, probably the most important uh, and most famous and most enduring was Albor's College. Originally established as an elementary school for boys in 1872, in 1899, its direction was given to newly arrived Reverend Samuel Jordan, who built it into a high school, then into a college accredited by the New York Regents to issue baccalaureate degrees. Albors educated a significant number of Iran's westernizing 20th century elite, even as it preached democracy, the dignity of manual labor, and the equality of the sexes. Evidence of its positive impact is suggested by the tribute paid to Jordan shortly after his death in the summer of 1952. In the midst of Dr. Mossadegh's premiership and the oil nationalization crisis which preceded the 1953 coup, nearly a thousand Alborz alumni, led by Ali Asghar Hekmat, Aliar and Jahan Shah Saleh, and Abol Ghassan Bakhtiar paid tribute to him. Nationalized in 1940, the institution continues as a premier Iranian secondary school. Jordan's work at Alborz may be summarized under a number of headings, including emancipatory liberalism. As he wrote in 1935, quote, our students have imbibed liberal ideas. They agitated for reforms, they cooperated with other forward-looking patriots in transforming the medieval despotism of 30 years ago into modern progressive democracy. He believed in the power of exercise and competitive games, not just to build strong minds and sound bodies, but also to teach the necessity of cooperation in order to overcome obstacles. Among Jordan's other activities was leading an annual climb of Mount Demavand, 18,000 feet high and about 50 miles east of Tehran. During the First World War, he led his boys in clearing the ground for the new Alborz campus, putting in several hours of good stiff work, as he wrote, before telling them, quote, I wanted to go down in history that of the history of the college that the first work on the new campus was done by the self-respecting students of the college who wished to show by action as well as by words 
that a new era had come to Iran, and henceforth any kind of work that is of service to mankind is honorable. Unspoken here, but often noted by alumni, although the bulk of the students were sons of the elite, fees were set so that one of every 10 students was on a full scholarship, including Abul Ghassan Bakhtiar, who first arrived in Tehran as the servant of an elite student. Jordan was encouraged also to engage students in the mission's relief work particularly during the famine of 1918, a famine which, by the way, may have killed as many as 25% of the population of the country. This stimulated Abul Qasim Bakhtiar, afterwards a dean at the University of Tehran's medical school, to travel to America to study medicine. Jordan also encouraged Satra Farman Farmayan to study in America, after which she established Iran's first school of social work. And I note that her memoir is a wonderful read and, and wonderful insight into the interwar history of the country. But Jordan, a proto-feminist, although his methods and rhetoric now seem archaic, he actively sought to improve the lot of women. As he wrote in his 1935 essay, Constructive Revolutions in Iran, Quote, by having Mrs. Jordan and the wives of other faculty members teach in the college, we have convinced those sons of nobles that girls too can be educated. By the example of husbands and wives working together and by definite teaching, we have convinced our students the young men are insisting on educated wives who can be real helpmates, friends, and confidants. Ultimately, Jordan was a pragmatic, conservative administrator as he pressed for reform for constructive revolution. He often told colleagues, in my opinion, to do a little more than what is safe is always just right. But in the end, he always deferred to constituted authority as he sought the best possible outcome for his work. As has often been noted in many circumstances, the perfect is the enemy of the good, and Jordan sought the good. I note too, and should have shown this slide earlier, that there was also a women's college. And I think I have skipped two pages, um, apologies. The mission's work with women, particularly in education, is overlooked in discussions of America's relationship with Iran before the 1978-79 revolutions. Two thirds of the missionaries were women, about half of them married, often to missionaries they had met in Iran. They came from middle-class families. At a time when most American women had not finished high school, they were college graduates, often with graduate degrees, including MDs. Vigorous, adventurous, assertive, and unwilling to accept the normative role for middle-class women in America as stay-at-home housewives and mothers. As missionary women, they followed socially acceptable careers as teachers, as nurses, as doctors. The girls' schools they established and ran, including Sage College, the women's counterpart to Alborz, played an important role in the development of Iranian modernization and female assertiveness, as Yasmin Razam Kalai has written. They taught by example, as well as by lecturing. Samin Danishvar, pictured in this photograph of sage students and faculty, became one of Iran's most important writers. I also note that on the left is a singular individual male. Persian literary professor Reza Zadeh Shafak, is an extraordinary person worth mentioning because he was Howard Baskerville's student at Tabriz during the revolution. And in fact, Howard Baskerville may well have died in his arms. And I have to note on a personal level as well that I met Dr. Shafak in 1959 when he came to community school to tell us the tale of Howard Baskerville. And I have always treasured that memory. As a Fulbright scholar at Stanford, Samin Danishvar studied writing with Wallace Stegner, whose most famous um, novel, Angle of Repose, is actually set here in Boise, Idaho. 
Her best-selling story, Sabushun, published in 1969, is about Shiraz under British occupation during World War II. And it was the first novel published in Iran by an Iranian woman. It was a bestseller. Her, she married Jalal Al Ahmad, whose essay, Rabzadegi, or West Toxification, has often been identified as a key text to understanding the coming of the 1978 revolution. And marriage seems to have been a literary partnership. The one woman missionary that I'm profiling here is Adelaide Kibbe, a medical missionary and perhaps typical of the sort. After graduating from Mills College and taking a medical degree at the University of California, she traveled to Iran in 1929, serving primarily at Mashhad and then at Rasht. In January 1941, she married, after 12 years on the field, her recently widowed colleague, John Davidson Frame. In December, their daughter, Margaret, was born. The next June, Dr. Frame died, probably of pancreatic cancer. Dr. Kibbe Frame carried on the hospital work by herself until it was possible for her to leave Iran on home leave in 1944, during the Second World War. Margaret Frame wrote, our trip was facilitated by the American government in exchange for information on the activities of the Russians in the area of Rasht. In 1946, Adelaide returned to missionary work in Rasht with her four-year-old daughter, Margaret. In 1948, she resigned in order to return to California to care for her father after the death of her mother. Then in 1950, she returned again to Rasht with eight-year-old Margaret in order to marry recently widowed Dr. Rolla Hoffman, with whom she had served in uh, Mashhad on her initial uh, time on the field. Adelaide and Rolla Hoffman continued the Rosh Hospital work until 1957, when Rolla turned 70 and the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions required him to retire because of his age. The board insisted that Adelaide also had to leave Iran at that time, despite being only 56 years old. The sexism of the mission policy is noted. Also noted is that to attend community school, my schoolmate Margaret had to board in Tehran, staying with a different missionary family each year. I'm going to shift gears here now and get to some of the heart of the ambiguities. The missionary enterprise was an aspect of the age of imperialism and cartels. In 1828, following victory in war, Russia imposed on Iran the Treaty of Turkoman Chai, including special rights for foreigners, preferential tariffs, extraterritorial status, and consular jurisdiction if they got into trouble. Collectively, these are known as the capitulations, and they loom high in Iran's resentment of the West. The, thus assured of security, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions began exploration of the mission in 1829, and in 1834 established the station at Ermia in western Azerbaijan. In 1871, the American board transferred responsibility for the mission to the New York-based Presbyterian board, which expanded missionary penetration throughout northern Iraq, establishing additional stations in Tehran, Tabriz, Hamadan, Rasht, Kazvin, Kermanshah, and Mashhad by 1911. In order to avoid unwanted duplication of efforts, however, and conflict between missionary societies with similar aims. In 1895, the Presbyterians negotiated a comedy agreement with the English Church Missionary Society. The boundary between the two missions, a line which I've drawn on the map on the right side of the screen, uh, from Khoramabad, Luristan to Kashan, and then along parallel 34 north to the Afghan border, Khoramabad to remain in the American sphere of influence in Kashan and that of the Church Missionary Society. This division, of course, foreshadowed the 1907 Anglo-Russian division of Iran into British and Russian spheres of influence. 
as well as a neutral zone, which during the First World War was ceded by Russia to Britain in exchange for British recognition of eventual Russian control of the Straits connecting the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. For much of its history, the Presbyterian mission had a close relationship with Britain. Until establishment of the American legation at Tehran in 1883, some 50 years after the mission was established at Urmia, the mission depended on Britain for diplomatic representation. Afterwards, all stations except Tehran continued to be represented by British consuls until American consuls were appointed. As the Tabriz missionaries wrote in 1907 on the occasion of the arrival of the first U.S. consul in Tabriz, American citizens, and this is a direct quote, residing in Azerbaijan, record our high appreciation of the favor conferred upon us by His Majesty's government. Prompt attention to our business, courteous counsel, and advice in difficulties, social amenities, the throwing around us of the ages of protection in times of danger, readiness at all times to put the power and prestige and even the treasury of the British government at our service, arduous and self-denying efforts to secure justice in cases involving the life of American citizens, each and all increase our measure of obligation and call for our special gratitude. They have helped to bind together the sister Anglo-Saxon nations in friendship. This binding together of the sister Anglo-Saxon nations foreshadowed in my mind the special relationship of the U.S. and the U.K. cultivated during and after the Second World War, both by Britain eager to augment its fading power with American assistance and by Americans eager to expand U.S. influence. These Americans included the future CIA director, Alan Dulles, who had his suits tailored on London's Savile Row. Like Howard Baskerville, Alan Dulles was the son of a Presbyterian minister. As noted above, he took a position as a short-term teacher in a Presbyterian mission school in India after graduation from Princeton in 1914 in order to see the world. After completing his contract in India, Dulles's uncle Bert, Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State Robert Lansing, arranged for him to join his brother John Foster Dulles in the U.S. diplomatic service. By 1924, Alan Dulles had risen to become head of the Near Eastern Affairs Division of the State Department, supervising the official U.S. response to the murder of U.S. Consul Robert Embry in 1924, an intelligence agent Dulles had dispatched to Iran to spy on the Soviet Union. As the careers of the Dulles brothers and their sister Eleanor suggest, Presbyterians were also patriots. As archaeologist turned spy Donald Wilbur noted in his 1986 memoir, recalling his a, a recruitment interview by the OSS in 1942, those gathered with him then included, quote, missionaries whose possible scruples about serving other than the Lord gave way before patriotism. Wilbur's persona during the war may well have been captured by journalist Joel Sayre, who wrote first in the New Yorker and then in a book drawn out of his articles, a redheaded American archeologist who is fond of going to villages, the smaller the better. He has only contempt for modern hygiene and will eat or drink anything offered him in the way of hospitality. Sad to say, patriotism led to disasters. During the First World War, the Presbyterian mission broke its adherence to separation of church and state. It also violated U.S. neutrality in the European Allies' war against the Ottomans. Iran proclaimed its neutrality in this war, but could not defend itself. It was already occupied by Russian and British troops after their 1907 partition treaty. Invasion by the Ottomans followed the outbreak of war in Europe, and it brought widespread fighting, especially to Azerbaijan, as well as food shortages and epidemic diseases 
throughout the country. In this context, in January 1918, Urmia missionary William Shedd accepted the position of honorary vice consul of the U.S. at Urmia. As Russian forces disintegrated following the Bolshevik coup in Petrograd and Moscow, Shedd and his associates helped to organize relief efforts and to finance a Christian army of Assyrians and Armenians to hold the line for the British against the Ottoman Turkish army and its Kurdish paramilitary allies. Resisting the Ottoman push towards Baku, using relief money collected to feed starving children for that purpose. And I'll take a note here, um, the raising of funds to the level of $30 million sounds like a lot of money, but if you correct for inflation, it is well over half a billion dollars in today's currency. Shedd knew he had gone too far in funding this army. And he wrote defensively to Board of Foreign Mission Secretary Robert Speer, quote, we have prevented the massacre of the Christian population here. It has been with great loss to the Muslims and with many crimes that one would like to have punished, punished summarily. I believe most fully in capital punishment under these circumstances, when the way to save life is to take the life of murderers. When this army collapsed in late July 1918, fled, excuse me, Shed fled with thousands of other refugees towards British lines. Along with many, many hundreds along the way, Shed died of cholera before he got there. Chaos continued in Iran long after the war in Europe ended. In the spring of 1919, Dr. Harry Packard, who had served as Shed's deputy in 1918, returned to Urmia to reestablish the American presence. In the midst of region-wide unrest provoked by a famine so severe that rumors of cannibalism were noted, he hired Kurdish guards to protect the mission in Urmia. Iranian officials seeking to crush the Kurdish insurrection bungled an effort to murder Ismail Aga Simko, chief of the Shikak Confederation. Simko sent his forces to raid Urmia in retaliation. After city forces drove off the invaders, they turned on the Presbyterian mission and its Kurdish guards. Some 270 of the 900 Christian refugees sheltering in the mission were killed, and the mission itself was stripped of all portable valuables, especially grain, gold, and guns. In July 1919, mission doctor Wilder Ellis, who is, if my cursor will come here in this picture, traveled to Urmia to survey the damage. He accompanied Doc, Father Pierre Fransom, a Dutchman who was head of the French Catholic mission in Tabriz, who during the war had been appointed as consul of neutral Spain in order to protect the French mission from the Ottomans. Fransom described the journey in his memoir. The Travelers discovered that the entire region west of Lake Urmia was under Kurdish control, but they were protected by a British political officer on the scene, a certain Captain Gerd, who invited them to accompany him on a visit to Simcoe in, quote, the fortress of the Kurdish chief perched on a high mountaintop. There, Gerd presented Simcoe with a gift, a magnificent machine gun, all new and glistening. After a private conversation with Gerd, Simcoe invited all of them to a hearty lunch, followed by demonstrations of Kurdish horsemanship and photography. And this picture, which is often uh, portrayed on the web, uh, is one of the photographs which was taken. In the Second World War, the United States actively participated in the war in the Middle East. 
In Iran, its most important role was maintaining a route to deliver Lend-Lease supplies to the Soviets through the so-called Persian Corridor. Iran, of course, had been uh, attacked without warning by the Russians and the British in August 1941, forcing Reza Shah to abdicate and beginning the reign thereby of the young Shah, who is known in America simply as the Shah. The mission of the Presbyterians welcomed the arrival of America, many American soldiers beginning in 1942, even as the mission itself was forced to retrench. The Iranian government had closed all of its schools except for community school in 1940. And in 1942, the mission closed the Tehran hospital, renting it out to the US government. In 1944, Dr. Jordan was induced to return to Iran for five months on a goodwill tour of the country sponsored by the US government. He traveled throughout the country, meeting twice with the Shah himself, and he was fated by high-ranking members of the Iranian government. Many other mission employees, past as well as present, joined the US war effort. These included Yahya Armajani, Elgin Grossclose, Taylor Gurney, Joseph Rasuli, Edward Wright, and Kyler Young. Armajani and Rasuli were Iranians who subsequently immigrated to the U.S. and became citizens. Wright, who had been born on the field at Tabriz, and therefore an Iranian law was considered an Iranian, had left the mission before the war in order to prepare for a second career as an academic. In 1942, he was recruited by OSS. After the war, he continued his career as an intelligence professional at the State Department. Rasuli, after the war, made his career with the U.S. Information Service, and Armajani became a professor of history at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Armajani's leaving the mission in 1942 reveals another ambiguity. Contrary to the spirit of the hymn, in Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, which was often sung in community school chapels each morning. The mission treated Iranian and American employees separately. Iranian-born Armajani was paid on a scale much lower than that paid to Americans. Although his colleagues pleaded with the authorities to allow him to be paid on an American scale, the Board of Foreign Missions refused, and Armajani felt compelled, therefore, to take the salary offered by the U.S. Army so that he could afford to maintain his growing family. He had recently married Ermia-born Ruth Muller, who actually appeared as a six-year-old in that picture I showed earlier of the Ermia missionaries. Um, the marriage was over the objection of some of the mission colleagues who thought it unseemly for an American girl to marry an Iranian man, despite the fact that Yahya Armajani was a graduate of the Princeton Seminary, had earned a PhD in history from Princeton University, and had been ordained a minister in the Presbyterian Church. Their daughter Noreen was born in January 1942, and the family needed more money than the mission could offer. In effect, the mission forced him out. The contradiction between the spirit of the hymn and the practice of the mission is appalling. Despite the uh, alliance between the US and the USSR during the war and their cooperation in shuttling war material from America to the Soviets via Iran, relations between the two governments were fraught. The Soviets kept most Americans out of their zone of occupation and the US government wanted to know what the allies were doing. And so, as noted earlier, when in 1944, Dr. Adelaide Kebe Frame wished to return to the States from Rasht with her infant daughter, Margaret, the US government debriefed her as payment for arranging transport to the United States via military aircraft. In his memoir, Donald Wilbur described a trip to Khorasan in 1946, under cover of archeological research, whose intelligence purpose was to observe the evacuation or non-evacuation of Soviet troops from Northeastern Iran. In Mashhad, he paid calls, including one on Dr. Hoffman of the American Mission Hospital. 
After making his observations, he returned to Mashan. Quote, I asked Dr. Hoffman to send a telegram to my OSS colleague, Joe Upton, an innocuous message that contained the words to indicate that the Soviets were in fact departing on schedule. This, of course, is remarkably in contrast to their position in Azerbaijan, where they stayed uh, until forced out by various machinations, including uh, at the United Nations. This account meshes with a conversation I had at a community school reunion with William Hopper, who expressed his horror and shock at discovering that the open and friendly conversations he had enjoyed with Wilbur, Wilbur in the 1950s had in fact been informing a CIA agent. Hopper, like Baskerville and Dulles, was also a Presbyterian minister's son who after graduating from college sought adventure by teaching at a mission school. In 1947, he went to Tehran and community school where he met and married another newly arrived short-termer, Molly Brown. His three years at community convinced him that his vocation was to become a minister and also to fulfill the mission of the original missionaries of the 1830s to revive the ancient church in Iran. He returned to Kentucky, earned a theology degree at the Louisville Presbyterian Seminary, was ordained a minister, then returned to Tehran as a missionary task to lead the Iranian Protestant church, which had been founded by the Americans and the British, to independence from its American founders. This he achieved during his 1953 to 1966 mission despite much opposition from many of his American missionary colleagues. Consequently, the Iranian church has been able to maintain itself and to hold its properties, despite the upheavals of the revolution and the rule of the Islamic Republic. It continues to hold services in the former mission central compound in Tehran, where the Hoppers had taught at community school, on Karama Sultaneh, now 30th of Tier, uh, near the Russian and British embassy compounds. Victory in the war against the Axis, of course, quickly alighted into the Cold War, whose first battle was over Azerbaijan and Kurdistan, and the consequent Anglo-American fear that Stalin was continuing the Tsar's struggle to expand Russian control to the Persian Gulf. In my view, the U.S. government in this era built upon the foundation of goodwill, which ambiguities aside, had long been fostered by the Presbyterian missionaries. Diplomats and intelligence agents cultivated relations with English speaking Iranians, especially alumni of mission schools. Indeed, in a private 1990 letter, uh, Yahya Armajani recalled, at the beginning of the Second World War, I was present at a reception at the American Embassy and heard the first secretary, Harold Minor, say to a group of visiting Americans something to this effect. We didn't realize the missionaries had left such a great amount of goodwill. We must cash in on this. Donald Wilbur explicitly referred to this cashing in process in his memoir. Under cover of continuing his archeological research for Arthur Upham Pope's survey of Persian art, he worked with OSS gathering information about both German and Russian activities in Iran during and immediately after World War II. He described his establishment of the Persian uh, America Relations Society, later called Iran America Society noting that among its members were Arthur Boyce of the Presbyterian Mission, formerly deputy to Samuel Jordan at Albors, and U.S. Army Colonel Norman Schwarzkopf, commander of the Iranian Gendarmerie, and of course, father of Storm and Norman of uh, the Iraq War fame. This picture il illustrates the founding of the Iran America Society in Tehran in about 1946. It is reproduced in Ali Pasha Saleh's volume celebrating the bicentennial of the American Republic. Uh, both American men sitting in the first row of the photo, Donald Wilbur and Kyler Young, were intelligence agents. 
Wilbur served with OSS during World War II, as noted above, and afterwards as a CIA contractor. He wrote the official CIA history of the 1953 coup, which overthrew Mossadegh, and he claimed in his memoir that the plan was basically mine. Not only did I develop the concept in the preliminary stage in Washington, but I played a key role in making it operational. Kyler Young had met his wife, Helen, when both were serving as missionaries in Iran before the war. Their late son, T. Kyler Young Jr., longtime director of the Royal Ontario Museum, was born in Rasht in 1934. Not long afterwards, Kyler Young Sr. left the mission to become an academic. In the words of his former student, Alan Luther, quote, he had growing doubts about the rightness of traditional proselytizing and became convinced that it was more Christian to learn about Islam and foster understanding of the Muslims than to seek to convert them. In effect, Young was converted by his time in Iran to become a missionary of Iranian civilization to American students. And he was one of the founders of Iranian studies in the United States at Princeton University. But he too was an American patriot. During the war, he left his professorial position at the University of Toronto to head the Near Eastern Research and Analysis section of OSS, serving under Harvard University European History Professor William Langer. After the war, he was public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1945-46, and again a special attache, what my father would have called a spook, in 1951. In the 1960s, however, he published a sharp criticism of then U.S. government policy towards Iran from his desk at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. As his obituary put it, Iran was in many ways a second homeland to him. And this, I conclude, both led him into wartime U.S. government service and later to criticize American politicians for actions detrimental to the American values he had preached in Iran and sought to achieve in the war against the Nazis. The Iranians in the photograph were American educated members of the Pahlavi elite. And I offer a few words about two of them. In 1946, Ali Pasha Salah was the US Embassy's Iranian advisor and chief interpreter. His brother, Ali Ar Saleh, who had worked as translator for the U.S. legation at the time of the murder of Consul Robert Embry, served as Shah as ambassador to the U.S. during Mossadegh's premiership. Afterwards, he headed the National Front opposition to the Shah while Mossadegh was under house arrest. Another brother, Jahan Shah Saleh, served Mohammad Reza Shah's Minister of Health. Mohandas Farooqi was also a member of a prominent American-influenced family. His father was Muhammad Ali Farooqi, member of the Iranian delegation to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference and prime minister under both Reza Shah and Mohammad Reza Shah. His brother Mahmoud Farooqi was a diplomat who served as Iranian ambassador in the U.S. in 1963-65 and later founded the Iranian Foreign Ministry's Institute of International Affairs. In 1978, Mahmoud Farooqi retired to America, advising the State Department not to allow the Shah to enter the U.S. The Shah, he said, quote, was bitterly hated in Iran and it would be very, very bad for the U.S. and for the West if the Shah settled here. The U.S., of course, failed to follow this advice, leading, uh, being led instead by the Rockefellers, who thought it would be a good idea to uh, let the Shah have medical attention in the U.S. And so I come to my conclusions. Given their culture and intellectual context, the Presbyterian missionaries came to Iran with the best of intentions. In their own view, they were altruists, altruists, a word and idea I first encountered at community school. They believed they forsook seeking fame and fortune in order to work in an environment more difficult than that at home in America. 
in part because of this belief, they made a distinction between missionaries who intended to serve a lifetime on the field and short-termers, people like Howard Baskerville and Alan Dulles in India, who intended to work only a short time between college and career. They did not acknowledge the arrogance of their worldview. Indeed, in his criticism of my first conference paper on this subject, Yahya Armajani, who was educated in mission schools and who married Ruth Muller, a missionary born on the field at Ormea, told me, quote, I knew all of these missionaries, and if they could hear you describe them as a cultural imperialist, they would turn over in their graves. I had not used that term, nor the word arrogance, but afterwards, privately, he urged me to continue my research. Two things stand out as I review my research and previous writing in advance of this presentation. First, I believe that in many ways, the Presbyterian missionaries became Iranian. Living their entire adult lives in Iran, they absorbed Iranian culture as if by osmosis, learning to bend like the grasses before the storms, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, even as they sought to render unto God what is God's. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm not used to talking for such a long time. Retirement has hurt my throat in a good way. In a way, the missionaries became American Iranians, and they felt abandoned when they were forced to leave Iran as by retirement or revolution. Surely here I reflect my own longing to return to Iran, which I have been able to do only twice since 1961. And as well, I note the sadness of Tehran-born, raised Margaret Frame, forced to leave her Iranian homeland as a teenager when her stepfather's turning 70 meant that she had to leave Iran with her family. That same sadness I saw in community school principal and Iran Zamin school founder Richard Irvine, who in the early 1960s left the mission in order to stay in Iran when the Board of Foreign Missions sought to transfer him to Egypt. And yet, he was forced by the revolution to leave the land he had loved since the early 1950s, where his children were born and where one had been buried. The contributions of the missionaries to Iran were great, as Yasmin Rostam Kolai has written, even if less than they claimed as they sought financial support from their sponsoring churches. Yet they also were naive especially about power politics in the age of the Cold War. After the failure of Shedd's effort to wield a Christian army, the missionaries labored as idealists, ministering to secular needs and helping to lead Iranians to Christ by the example of their lives. This perhaps deliberate naiveness enabled the U.S. government to make use of their knowledge of the country in, as it engaged in warfare, both hot and cold, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Some missionaries joined in the fight. Did they forsake God's work for that of Uncle Sam? The World War I words of Urmia missionary Hugo Muller, Yahya Armajani's father-in-law, come to mind. The stars and stripes symbolize two great causes, he wrote and united them, the cause of Christ and the cause of America. He continued to argue that the flag was the symbol of Protestant Christianity quite as much as it was the symbol of America. This fraught connection between American nationalism and Christian belief persists in the 21st century. Most missionaries did not in fact leave the mission to serve the U.S. government, but knowingly or not, they became spy uh, sources for spies such as Donald Wilbur. The missionaries have been described as agents of imperialism, political as well as cultural. They have also been described as ha having held aloof from politics. I believe there is truth to both points of view. And so to open our question and answer session, I end with the words of Johnny Cash, which he sang to 
the Richard Nixon at the White House. What is truth? And that is the end of my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for this really enlightening educational presentation and so much of our history, and by our history, I mean American-Iranian relations history, is caught up in ambiguities. And ambiguity of uh, what was the real mission versus what was the result. And acknowledging those ambiguities properly is the best form of reconciliation, meaning uh, we need to be, understand that like everything else, goodwill and good charity, all that was part of the mission, yet these were all caught up in the geopolitics of a country that has experienced so much that you talked about from famine, imperialism, colonialism, and now the Cold War. So we will go now to our question and answer period. And we've been getting questions coming in uh, uh, from our audience. So Matt, do you want to start with some of the questions that are coming in? Yeah, we have some great questions. Um, one uh, is prefaced with uh, this. This is a sincere, not a cynical question. Um, the question is, how did the Calvinist doctrine of the predestined elect influence Presbyterian mission strategies in Iran? Did, did the missionaries, um, did they presume the saved needed no evangelism? Um, uh, were um, uh, they there uh, to convert um, all of it? Um, so how do we think about this nature of you know, Presbyterian um, doctrine of the elect? Well, this is something I've actually thought about a great deal and have not read anything particular about, but it seems to me that um, one of the, the clear things um, that one can see with regard both to medical, but especially educational practice was that they uh, sought out uh, the wealthy and powerful um, in order to uh, improve their access to society as a whole. And I think um, that the underlying notion that um, worldly signs of divine election uh, may have underlain this um, practice, even though it was, of course, from a practical point of view, excellent, because if you help the elite, they would be able to uh, be influenced, possibly, but certainly you can see this in their uh, attitude towards uh, tuition at the schools, that one of every 10 students was a scholarship student and that effectively it was the elite who were paying for that. Um, thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Um, preface with fascinating talk, the question is, did the Catholic missions from the French figure into the British US uh, comedy agreement? Um, uh, how did that uh, play out in places like Ormia and elsewhere? Um, my sense is that um, there was a, a pretty strong Catholic Protestant rivalry uh, ongoing until the First World War hit and suddenly the British and the French were on the same side. Um, in Ermia, it was definitely an, an American uh, French competition for Christian souls. Uh, and the French may have had a better uh, experience uh, in terms of, of converting more uh, to their Chaldean church than the Americans did to the American church. Uh, but the English in the North were not the church mission society, but rather the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission to the church of the East. And this expli mission explicitly refused to uh, convert Iranians to a English style church. They wanted to uh, develop the, chiefly by education, uh, the traditional church. And 
uh, they were much less successful than they were uh, than excuse me than the Russians were in gaining uh, influence among the Assyrian uh, Nestorian Church of the East. And in 1914, before the outbreak of the war, uh, the Nestorian Church, the old church, in fact, went into communion with the Russian Church, and and at the same time, the British decided to withdraw from the field. And when they physically left, the, the, the British missionaries physically left uh, Iran uh, in the Ermian field, uh, they actually turned over their facilities to the American church. So there was great cooperation uh, between the Anglicans and, and the uh, Americans. I think in Ermia, even more so than across the dividing line between Tehran, which effectively was the head of the American mission, and Esfahan, which was uh, the seat of the uh, bishop in Persia. That's so interesting. I, it seems like when, at least when we consider the period prior to the First World War, the kind of uh, factionalism of the Protestant Reformation and Counter-Reformation might be as significant as kind of the, the great game and this um, kind of competition between nation states. Of course, they overlap. Yeah. It's fascinating yeah. to hear you talk about those dynamics. Um, there, there's, yes, go on. Oh, please. No, I was just going to say there's also a class division that that emerges. And um, I bounced early drafts of this paper off um, friends from community school and, and colleagues, and they pointed to the class divisions among missionaries as well, which is something that I hadn't thought about, uh, that the missionaries in the period before the first, Second World War uh, came from a w relatively wealthy background, uh, which is why they could afford to do this sort of thing. Um, for example, when, when uh, Adelaide Kibbe went out to Iran, uh, her mother came with her. Uh, her mother had been born in China to missionary parents, uh, but there was obviously enough wealth in the family so she could make a round the world trip uh, as she did, uh, escorting her um, maiden 29 year old daughter to her post in Majan. Uh, whereas after the Second World War, increasingly the church was. Uh, less and less uh, wealthy compared to other aspects of America, and the missionaries tended to be recruited from uh, much less wealthy families as well. And I, when I researched in the archives of the Church Missionary Society, I had some hints that, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, rather better endowed British people regarded the Church Missionary Society as something of a, um, how do I want to say, it? well, I can't do anything better than what I was told more than once. Well, you know, the Church Missionary Society is an evangelical branch of the Church of England. Um, and that evangelical term was used in a way that sounded to me disapproving whether it was for class or for religious purposes, I don't know. But um, I did not have that sense among them uh, in researching about missionaries in the uh, pre-World War II period in Iran. Very interesting. Um, maybe I'll just ask one more question and, and Bahman, maybe you have some that you'd like to raise, but there are a lot of questions that deal with um, conversion. Um, the questions are all worded differently, but we probably have a half dozen questions that deal with um, mm -hmm. how seriously the missionaries took conversion, um, if they were, you know, kind of counting the numbers of converts that they um, had, um, if there was a point where um, the notion of uh, evangelical work among Muslims became kind of, it was recognized to be perhaps not that fruitful of a field. Um, and just generally the question of conversion is on a lot of people's minds. Okay. Um, well, I, I will start in a sense with the 1830s when the point of the mission activity was to rekindle the ancient church 
as a missionary force. They were not seeking uh, initially to convert Muslims at all, although their long-term hope, I presume, was to get Iranian Christians to be able to do that. Um, and of course, they came into an environment in which there was strong resistance to conversion work, uh, both in terms of, uh, how do I wanna say this? All of the local communities were resistant to ideas of converting to Western style Christianity. This is true of the Christian communities as well. I think the, the old churches, whether Armenian or Assyrian, uh, were resentful of the efforts uh, of foreign missionaries to hive off part of their community as a separate church, which of course is what happened in the Arab world as well as in Iran. Um, it gets even stronger in Iran, of course, uh, for Muslims um, because the state is an explicitly Islamic state. And when the uh, Muslim religious leaders objected to efforts to preach Christianity to Muslims, the state reinforced their point of view. And I think this is a consistent point of view that you see in Rajar times, you see in Pahlavi times, it is not a new thing with the Islamic Republic. Um, and so the American missionaries uh, tread very, very carefully um, and were more than once uh, tongue whipped by Iranian officials when some of their more enthusiastic people got out of hand. And so in practical terms, it seems to me that the vast majority of uh, converts that were made came out of the Christian communities um, who had little defense uh, against this kind of activity. The Iranian government didn't really care, I think, terribly much unless there was a political upheaval. Uh, I think the willingness of the old Nestorian church to go into communion with Russia may have reflected the fact that it was an Orthodox church uh, closer in doctrine uh, to Moscow than it was to the doctrine of Rome or the doctrine of um, I guess we can talk about the doctrine of, of Westminster, but we can't talk about the doctrine of Philadelphia. Uh, but you know, Calvinism or the Episcopal approach was was further from them. Um, it's one of the the most interesting works, and I, I tend to like things that come at me tangentially. Is a work. Um, about the Alliance Israelite Universelle in the Ottoman Empire, uh, whose author should come to me and isn't a uh, Stanford historian, uh, but the book is called uh, French Jews, Turkish Jews. And the, the simple version is that um, French Jews sent missionaries to the Ottoman Empire and to Iran as well, in order to convert Turkish Jews or Iranian Jews into becoming French Jews. And of course, the indigenous Jewish communities regarded the Western missionaries of the Americans, the French, uh, the British, uh, as being terribly dangerous to their communities because they offered education, Western languages, science, mathematics, uh, modern medicine, things that were very appealing. And so they asked the French to send Jewish teachers to protect their communities from the danger of, of, of conversion. So I, you know, to me, this 
creates a situation in which it's clear that all communities objected to the con the idea of proselytization, even as they eagerly adopted uh, the secular advantages that were on offer from the missionaries. I'm not sure that this is a direct answer to the questions that you're seeing, but it, it is the kind of conclusion on this issue that I've come to in, in thinking about the issue. Great, I'm going to give Matt a break, Michael, but a couple of questions have come, and I think these were mentioned by you. One was the relationship of the missionaries with the Kurdish mm. component. Now, uh, in Hamadan, they had a very active mission, as you know. Yes. And in Urmia, uh, one of the questions asked is that Dr. Joseph Cochran also maintain a good relations with the Kurds for the protection of the clinics and so forth. So how did, how did that Kurdish identity in Iran, I mean, Iran being such a multilingual, multi-ethnic society, obviously mm -hmm. for many of these missionaries before they embarked on their mission to Iran, they had no idea of the complexity of the Iranian society, right? right? So in right. their writings, in their communications, how much did this multi-aspect of Iran impacted their mission? I have no definitive answer. Mm -hmm. um, if I can quote a former lecturer who I heard on this Institute's webinars, it's complicated and I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that strikes me is, is sort of a, an aphorism that I've often put forward and I, I can't put my finger on where it was I first saw this. You know, I've got a note somewhere in my mess. But uh, one of the missionaries made a very revealing um, observation about the complexity, which is that before I learned to speak Turkish, I needed an interpreter to help me communicate with the Persians. And this of course was a missionary at Tabriz where the bulk of the population speak our Azeri Turkish as their native language. And so when the missionaries are referring to Persians, they're referring most often to Shia Muslims whether their native language was Persian or some other language spoken in this complex society. And with regard to the Kurds, one of the issues that perhaps they didn't take adequately into account is that the bulk of the Kurds were Sunni rather than Shia, and so the conflict that you have among the three major communities in the area of, of Urmia, Kurds, Nestorian Christians, and uh, Persians, is a, is a conflict that's on linguistic and religious community basis. And another division that they were aware of and they reflect, especially in the context of the First World War, is the difference between the people of the mountain regions who are primarily uh, pastoralists, uh, who are constantly feuding over um, flocks of sheep and goats, uh, raiding each other, and this is true of, of, of Kurds against other Kurds, it's true of Kurds against Nestorian, mountain Nestorians. So you, ha you have the, the mountain people and then you have the people of the plain, whether they are Christian farmers or Muslim farmers. Uh, and these differences are exacerbated. And in my, you know, I come at this from the outside. I come at it with a, a tremendous sense of, 
not understanding enough of the detail to be able to give definitive answers. One of the things that strikes me is that pastoral peoples uh, have the advantage over farmers and urban people in that they have mobility, they can move. And this is traditionally uh, easily transformed into military advantage. And so in hiring Kurds as guards, they're hiring people who have the ability to, uh, to do guarding duties much more than farmers or city people would, would doing. And I think they're doing this without a sense of, of the exacerbation of relationships that's caused by religious differences. And of course, the unwillingness of every tribal community to be controlled by any urban environment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it's a fraught situation, which in normal times they can cope with reasonably well. But when you have a war breaking out among contending European powers, and of course, the, uh, the, the coming of the Ottomans with their German advisors across the border fighting against the Russians, uh, all hell breaks loose, quite literally. And uh, yet, if you look back at, at pre-World War I times, which I haven't done adequately uh, in my own work, I've really focused on the interwar period. Um, it seems to me that uh, with the exception of a few cases where people got into trouble, uh, generally speaking, they managed to negotiate the differences reasonably well. Mm -hmm. uh, going about their business of good works uh, with the passive support of the, of the government in Tehran, which, of course, ruled through its local notables uh, in a traditional style. Right. So and another uh, participant has asked the question, what was the relation of the missionaries with the Baha'is? In general, I think they regarded the Baha'is um, as unwelcome um, competitors in the same way they um, regarded Baptists and um, Catholics. And um, I would not put Muslims in this tradition, but you know, these are people who seem to be coming from the outside who are competing for um, creating a new modern Iran, which the missionaries wanted to do, uh, and which was part of the reason why I think uh, the government was in general rather supportive of what they were doing. Um, and yet, um, one of the things, you know, I've not looked at the, the John Elder papers um, in enough detail to tell uh, what is going on about it. But he was interested in enough in the Baha'is to on one of his trips to the Mediterranean region, actually to go to Haifa and to meet with the hierarchy of the Baha'i uh, community in that city where uh, they had taken refuge from Iran after the emergence of the church and the, and the, and the the conflict between the Baha'i faith and, and the Islamic Shia tradition out of which it had emerged. So, you know, it's mixed. It's mixed. I could just jump in really fast. What, I was just um, thinking about what you're saying, and it, it does seem like there is this kind of, uh, it's, a t it's, a tough, it's a relationship that's tough to describe between the missionaries and the Baha'is. And we have, in addition to elder, uh, one of his contemporaries, William Miller, uh, who wrote a book called The Baha'i Faith. And, you know, so it's, they're kind of following in some ways in this Orientalist tradition, maybe set by someone like E.G. Brown of, you know, kind of weighing in on these matters in a particular way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, That's right. And um, so uh, go ahead, Matt. I think there are a couple other questions about Alborz College and... Um, there are a lot of questions, and, um, um, and I don't know, uh, Bahman, you may have some, um, uh, but um, there's a question about Al Bors College, just generally um, um, kind of when 
uh, its doors shut and kind of what its um, kind of legacy uh, might be. I, I'd kind of add to that question. Um, are there continuities between Al Boris College and community school? Do these uh, kind of points of emphasis that Samuel Martin Jordan had kind of carry forward under people like Richard Irvine? Or do you um, kind of see a real break um, when Al Boris College is closed in 1940? Um, I don't, again, it, it, it's complicated. First of all, Al Boris, <clears throat> Alborz continues um, as a high school under the, Iran, under the Iranian government after 1940. And um, the, art, the issue, the special issue of uh, Iranian studies uh, on Alborz College that was published in what, 2011, uh, really focuses uh, a great deal on the post-1940 experience, which uh, for for decades actually was under the leadership of someone who had worked with Jordan. And there is um, a great deal of continuity, even though it is a thoroughly Iranian uh, secondary school, but mm -hmm. the emphasis on excellence, on science, um, I think continues. The idea of, uh, you know, even after the American relationship is withdrawn, uh, the emphasis seems to be on Iran being the best it can be by merging the, the best of the Western world with the best of the Iranian tradition, which of course was, was what um, Jordan's idea was as he touted uh, the school in the States trying to raise money. Uh, I think that J. Richard Irvine saw himself as uh, a... I don't like the phrasing that wants to come out of my mouth, uh, a second coming of, of Samuel Jordan. He saw himself as a continuing the Jordan tradition of trying to uh, build a modern Western style educational institution in the midst of an Iran to which he dedicated his entire life and which he did not want to leave. Um, and I think that the affection that uh, the graduates of the alumni of Iran Zamin, which he founded after he left community school, have for that school uh, really uh, emphasizes that. Uh, you know, I think that that he is uh, a less touted figure in some respects, but in in many respects, he's he's continuing the tradition. On the other hand, uh, you know, he's in a very, very different environment. When Jordan went out to Iran in 1898, uh, there, this is a, more than uh, a decade before Howard Baskerville's death defending um, Tabriz in the midst of a, a revolution, the first revolution, whereas uh, Irvine went out in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, and got caught up in that. And so his efforts to build a school, uh, and I think he very much wanted to create a, a collegiate level institution, um, were in a very different circumstances. And the mission, of course, and again, we've talked about this privately, that uh, the mission was uh, rather resistant to his efforts to uh, build the school into something more than an institution for their children and whoever else uh, was going to come along and pay the fees necessary for the teachers that they were to hire. Great. Um, I, I wanna get this question or this bunch of questions in. Um, because it's not often that we have an expert on interwar uh, U.S.-Iran relations. We get, <laughs> yes. you know, we get people who write about Justin Perkins and you know, people who write about you know, more contemporary international relations, but uh, often not the, that interwar period, the Reza Shah period in particular. Um, so there are questions about Imbri and, and some questions that are clearly drawing on some of your you know, research articles. Right. Um, but one question that I think really is, is um, and it captures uh, the essence here is, 
um, a researcher who's doing some work on American expertise in Iran during this period. And uh, they want to know what kind of dynamics affected bilateral relations, especially in the late 30s. Um, so, you know, were there kind of a set of factors that really mattered in the late 30s or in the interwar period more broadly that are maybe distinct when compared to some of the earlier and later periods that we, we hear more about? Um, my, my sense of the entire interwar period is that the U.S. regarded it as uh, a British preserve. Uh, they were intrigued enough by the initiative undertaken by Hussein Allah after the disaster of, of rejection at the Paris Peace Conference uh, to spend Milspa as a private agent. Um, they were, the bankers in New York were interested in negotiating a loan uh, because that would be very profitable. Um, and Iran, of course, wanted the money to, um, for the same reason that the, many Iranian patriots had been willing to work with the British in, in the 1919 Anglo-Persian ag agreement that uh, Iran refused to accept. Um, but the British, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in the, in the British archives, regarded Mill Spa uh, with a jaundiced eye initially. They feared he would be another Schuster, and they did not like Schuster. Uh, but they succeeded in their own mind in converting Mill Spa into an agent of their own policy, which was to build up Iran as a uh, country strong enough to stand on its own feet, to resist the Russians, to resist the other forces that would cause chaos and endanger their, their oil fields. I don't see the United States uh, having any particular interest in the country until Pearl Harbor, and then uh, the British are eager to involve the Americans um, in getting Lendley supplies to Russia, which was essential for the war effort and to protect the oil fields uh, at, in particular. Um, they also, of course, were perfectly aware that the British were perfectly aware that the Iranians from the moment that Britain invaded in August, 1941, were eager to get the Americans involved as a counterweight to the British and the Russians who had uh, essentially extinguished Iran's sovereignty even though they paid lip service uh, in the tripartite tripartite agreement to Iran being a sovereign state allied in the war against Germany. Um, and so the, the United States uh, immediately uh, after Pearl Harbor begins to develop not only the Persian Gulf Command, which I alluded to in terms of, of the, the spreading of, of military assistance to the Soviets, but also in missions to the Iranian army, which is described as the worst army we've ever seen, but we're learning the land. Uh, the, the gendarmerie, uh, the, um, the force that basically maintained police control over the country outside of the cities, to the urban police forces, uh, to the education ministry. Uh, I've only got four fingers turned down, but there were far more than five missions that were undertaken during the Second World War, which, of course, uh, began to expand slowly after the war as the Cold War developed and exploded, of course, after 1953, which is how I wound up as a 13-year-old in Tehran in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. We're going to have one last question. Uh, it, uh, the participant wants to ask it live. So we're gonna turn okay. his uh, microphone on and go ahead, uh, Joe, you can ask your question.
Oh, I guess uh, we didn't have it. So, Matt, you want to read the question for? Sorry, I have to find it here in the mix of so many <laughs> questions, which um, I'm sorry to those of you who asked really good questions that just haven't um, been, been asked yet. Um, but the question actually comes, I can't find it because it's in the chat bar. Uh, the, the, um, well, sorry, I'm struggling to find it now, so. We will we will uh, yeah. send it as a chat message, text message or email to you after okay. the talk, and yeah. I think we can answer it. Perfectly. But let me first of all thank you, Michael, for this wonderful presentation. I think you you brought so many of your articles that I have read, and kind of a uh, now I'm going to go back again to it. And uh, <laughs> uh, I first of all we're going to publish the recording of this presentation for those who couldn't attend it. And we would love to publish your paper also and uh, put it on our publication website. It is such an important period of US-Iran relations that has not been paid enough attention to. And one of our institute's goal is to build on this historical relation before we get to the contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. So we are working on our next year's uh, lecture series and uh, we are very pleased to end this year with Reza Aslan. As I mentioned, we will uh, ask everyone to join us for the April 23rd lecture on Howard Baskerville by Reza Aslan. And for any other questions that we could not get to Michael, please email it to me or send it to us. Matt and I will uh, be more than happy to share it with Professor Zurensky. Again, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for putting the time and it's nice to see you back on screen again uh, <laughs> after all these years. Well, thank you very much. For